thank you folks for joining us today for our Doctors in Program. Uh, whether you're here with us on Zoom or watching on Facebook or seeing this recording later. Uh, we are joined today by Dr. Mike Bozzi, who is going to lead us in this discussion on exercise and physical activity for older adults. Um, and so we are happy to have him here with us. Uh, just a couple of things to share at the, the start here. Um, if you are with us on Zoom, you can put in your questions at any time on through the chat or through the Q&A feature. If you're watching us on Facebook, uh, you can make a comment and I will relay those, uh, those to our presenter uh, to answer those questions. And so feel free to pop in at any time with your questions uh, to be sure that we get those answered for you. Um, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over. Thank everyone again for, for joining us and turn it over to you, Dr. Mike. All right. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mike Bozzi. As David said, uh, I specialize in primary care as well as sports medicine. So you know, physical activity and aging are things that I think about all the time every day and think are definitely good things for us to be talking about and, and working on always. Um, so brief overview of the things that we want to address today. Um, you know, as far as physical activity goes, you know, what are the benefits for it of everyone, and especially in older adults? What are the different types of exercises that we can do? Um, what are some modifications to the typical exercises that we can adapt to meet certain populations' needs or certain, you know, certain patients' individuals' needs? And then how do we sort of set a plan to all put that all in motion? Because uh, you know, even if you know all the things that you can do, it's sometimes it's hard to make the actual steps to make that happen. So we want to make sure we have all the tools in our toolkit that we need. So as we said, the first kind of question that we're gonna be addressing is why we should move. Um, you know, as far as some basic reasons go, reasons to move is that, you know, it can be fun. It, it can, you know, feel good to get out and exercise and to do things and move your body around and do new things. Um, and then, you know, these group kind of activities. So movement in a social setting where you're working together or you're side by side or you're, you know, outdoors doing, you know, gardening or anything like that, doing lots of different times that allows for a lot of time for socialization as well uh, as getting your heart rate up. So there's multiple benefits more than just the actual toll on your muscles and bones and joints that, you know, there's a lot of stimulation that can happen uh, elsewhere as well. And so, you know, beyond those uh, sort of fundamental reasons that movement and, and physical activity are good for us is the medical uh, benefits that come from physical activity as well. Um, so they've, certainly done studies on a variety of things and how physical activity can impact the risk for development of a variety of medical conditions. Um, and so things like dementia, they've shown may have a lower risk of that if you keep yourself moving. Um, there's a reduced risk of mood disorders like anxiety and depression in young age as well as old age. Um, it can improve your quality of sleep so that you sleep through the night better, you can sleep longer, um, you have more continuous sleep, all of that can be very beneficial if you are moving during the day. Um, and then you can build your strength so that things like falls are less likely to happen. Um, and then if they do happen, your bones and muscles are stronger and can help absorb that impact better. Uh, and so you have a decreased risk of a major injury like a hip fracture or something like that. Um, that could be a serious injury for someone of any age. So reducing your risk for something like that is certainly a big goal when we're talking about uh, movement for especially our older adults. Um, you know, this is another sort of evidence-based thing. This is a chart that comes from a, a study that was looking at sitting time versus movement time and how that sort of reduces the risk for all-cause mortality in this case in adults. And so, um, as you can see here, this red section where people are doing a lot of sitting every day, they're living a very sedentary life and they don't get up out of a chair, they're on the couch, they're not moving around. Um, they have an increased risk at any given time uh, of, of death actually, and all cause mortality is what that means. Um, whereas people who are moving more often, you can see move into this green zone. And that is where people are having, uh, you know, better quality of life as well as longer life because, you know, at least related to their movement. Um, and as you can see, uh, the more you sit or the more you, the less you sit and the more you move, the more you move into this green area. And that's where we want everyone to be if they can you know, as much as they are capable of being, 
um, because that gets the blood flowing, it gets the heart moving, and it gets, you know, as we said, decreases the risk of a lot of other things like falls and dementia and depression and all of those things. Um, so we want to, everyone's goal we want to be to move in this kind of diagonal direction towards the green um, to make sure that they are getting all that they need out of their bodies and, and kind of doing what they need to be doing to stay healthy and active. Um, and again, this is another chart looking at, uh, you know, is movement good for you, basically? And this is saying, yes, there's, there's, you know, no amount of movement that you can do that's a bad idea. So as long as you're being physically active, this is a really good thing for you. Um, and this chart is showing, basically, the more people exercise is going along to the right here, uh, the less likely they are to die, right? And so 1.0 being the, the baseline here, if you are exercising, you know, you do the CDC recommended amount, which is 150 to 300 minutes of physical activity in a given week. So about, you know, 30 to 50 minutes a, a day, um, you can decrease your all cause mortality by about 30 to 40%. And that's a huge number that, you know, we don't have any pills or any, you know, surgeries or anything like that, that can decrease someone's risk of death by 30%. There's no there's no medicine on the market. There's no procedure. There's no magic bullet that can decrease your risk of death by 30%. But getting up out of the chair and going for a walk for 30 minutes a day does that. And so that is why we try to really focus on these things so much because this is better than anything, any tool that we have, you know, any special prescription or, you know, insurance thing or anything like that. This is better than anything, any other tool we have to keep our patients healthy and happy and living longer. It's just getting them to get up and move. Um, so physical activity is just so important in so many ways. And this is, you know, the be all end all of it is that it can keep you alive. And that is uh, a really important thing to keep in mind. And as it says here over the right, the more, the better, the more you want to exercise, the better. No one's ever going to say that you're doing too much. Um, so as we talked about a little bit, you know, there are some risks for sedentary behavior and modern society has kind of taken us from being you know, our upright and active hunter gatherer selves and put us back in front of a computer or on a couch, you know, watching TV or reading a book instead of being up and standing and moving and walking. Um, so sedentary behavior, you know, increases your risk of, of some certain medical conditions, certainly. And we know that it can cause issues with things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and that, as we showed in the earlier slide, that your increased risk of all cause mortality um, just from sitting, sitting around for too long. So again, even if you're not getting up and going for a brisk walk or going for a jog or anything like that, just getting up and standing for a little while can be very beneficial. Now, obviously this is an oversimplification, right? So not everyone has the time to make it, has the time to go for a walk or go for a jog or go into the garden or anything like that. Um, there are a lot of obstacles to, to physical activity. And the point of this talk is kind of just to, again, re-emphasize that physical activity is so important for us, for our health and for a number of other reasons. And so the ways that we can adapt ourselves to that and, and make it work for each individual person is gonna be really important. So um, simple things can make it hard to move, like just finding the time or the motivation. Um, you know, it is sometimes just easier to stay on the couch than to get up and get those, get the muscles moving, get your joints moving. That can be painful and difficult. And it takes, certainly takes effort and energy that we don't always have. Um, it also takes know-how, right? Like it takes, it takes experience and someone there to kind of coach you through things sometimes. Um, and, you know, how does that, how does the, you know, interact or how does a physical activity interact with our medical history or our current medical conditions um, is not always clear to everyone. And there are certainly sometimes are people worry that they may make things worse. They may make their pain worse. They may make, you know, they could put themselves at increased risk of something if they were to get up and, and start exercising. And so that's kind of what this talk is hoping to focus on as well, is that provide some reassurance that this is a good thing for you, as well as these last couple of points is to you know provide you with the resources and some, some information that you might not know is out there around the area to, to get yourself active again. Um, so what are the, some of the kinds of things that we can do that we would consider movement? And this is certainly a very broad category. So, you know, the title of the talk is addressing both physical activity and exercise and drawing that small distinction, I think is an important one. So physical activity is anything that gets you moving, right? You can get your, get you standing up out of that chair, even do things in a chair that would still count as physical activity. Um, but things just like 
gardening or going to walk the dog or, you know, doing some yard work, taking, you know, walking, taking the stairs instead of the elevator or walking down the hall, you know, just going somewhere to get something. These are little things that your body is moving where you're not doing that deliberately for the sake of exercise, but that it still has that same benefit that exercise does. Whereas exercise in particular is this sort of planned out activity for the day where you are going to go move your body specifically for the sake of that movement, that strain, that stress, that breaking a sweat. All of that is very important too. Um, and this requires a more dedicated time and planning compared to something like physical activity that's just sort of happening throughout the day, but that you still can add or augment as the, your day goes on. The exercise portion is, you know, the next step up, I, I like to think, um, where you're dedicating yourself to that specific activity uh, and really putting your time and attention and focus on that while you're doing it over and over again to build your strength and, and obtain sort of that health benefit from it. Um, as far as recommendations go for, you know, what is physical activity? How much should we be doing? Um, I think I mentioned a few slides back on that chart that the CDC has recommended at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. And so that can be things, there's pictures down here, you know, golfing, swimming, raking, playing basketball, um, gardening, going for a walk. All of that would be moderate intensity activity that gets your heartbeat going a little bit faster. Maybe you break a little bit of sweat. Um, and so that's gonna be how you obtain a lot of that cardiovascular benefit. Uh, and 150 minutes a week maybe sounds like a big number, but if you break it up and you're trying to do something every day, you know, that's only about 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day if you give yourself a break on a couple of days on the weekend or something. Um, and I think that there's time within the day to be broke, to break that up into, even if it's 10 minutes here, five minutes there, or something to just get yourself moving a little bit here and there, that can add up really quickly. Um, and then I think the best, you know, another important thing to keep in mind on the right here is that keeping your muscles and bones and joints strong is really important as well. Um, and so muscle strengthening activity, that weight training kind of thing, um, whether it's with weights or with body, with your own body weight or with rubber bands or any kind of thing that kind of gets your muscles under tension a little bit can get them stronger. And that can improve a lot of things like we talked about, like stability, decreased falls, you know, decreased injury risk. All of that is really important too. It can make your bones stronger, all of that. Um, so these are kind of two things in tandem and you know, muscle training in muscle strength training in and of itself is can be aerobic activity and of a moderate intensity. So these things can go hand in hand and even be the same activity at times. Um, so as far as aerobic activity, you know, this is more for endurance and cardio, right? So this is when you're moving over and over again. If you're on the elliptical machine, you're on the treadmill, you're going for a walk outside, um, jogging if your your knees are feeling up to it. Um, or riding something like a bicycle or a stationary bike or recumbent bike, um, anything that, that kind of gets that rhythmic movement going where your muscles get to you know, pump over and over again and get your heart really working. Swimming is another incredibly good cardiovascular exercise. Um, that in particular is low weight bearing. It can be good for your joints. Um, and it really is a whole body workout that can really get your body moving and can be adapted pretty much at any pace and with any uh, any difficulties, you know, as far as a floating device or an assistive device, there are many ways to get people very comfortable in the pool and while staying active. Um, and so I've used this term, you know, moderate intensity, and I think that can sometimes scare people away sometimes because there's high intensity and intensity in itself sounds kind of, you know, kind of scary. Um, but moderate intensity basically is just us trying to focus on um, how we get you moving. Um, so, you know, and how we get your heart rate up. So getting your heart rate faster is the main goal of these exercises of these physical activities, right? Because that's going to be what, you know, basically tells your body, yeah, I need these muscles. Yeah, I need, I need my heart to be working. I need to, you know, it's got to keep going, going, going. Um, and that's what's going to keep it healthy. And so moderate activity is going to be anything really that gets your heart rate up and you're breathing a little bit more intense. Um, something so you can still talk during it. So if you're going for a walk and you're talking to someone, you know, your friend walking with you, your partner walking with you, um, that's fine. That's still moderate intensity. Maybe you shouldn't be able to sing an opera or something like that because you don't have, you're trying to use some of your lung capacity for uh, breathing for the sake of your exercise. But uh, moderate intensity still is, you know, not so fast that you're 
you know, keeling over or anything. You should still be able to talk in your normal voice. And so it should not be too intimidating, I hope. And usually that means, you know, walking at a couple miles per hour, uh, a reasonable pace, I think. And um, if you are feeling more ambitious and you want to go up into the high intensity kind of neighborhood, um, that's when you're, you know, can only say, you know, a few breaths at a time while you're talking, while you're trying to work out. And that's a good sign that your heart rate is really getting up there. And if you want to do that, you even need less time to set aside for exercise for the week. So even like 10 to 15 minutes a day of that is going to be enough to really get the cardiovascular benefits that decrease your risk for health conditions and death like we talked about. Um, so again, we talked about cardio. Now we can talk about muscle strengthening. Um, so those kinds of things, we want to focus really on the big muscles in the body, the core and trunk muscles. So your big muscles in your legs and your butt and your hips, um, as well as your chest and your back and your, your abdominal muscles, your shoulders. Those are the things that really keep your body upright and sturdy, they, you know, <clears throat> keep you healthy and active and will really allow the rest of you to move if, as long as you have a stable center, uh, that everything can attach onto, um, so for these things, as far as muscle strengthening, you have to push yourself a little bit, right? You can see the second bullet point here. The key is to do more than you would do in a regular activity. So if you just keep doing the same thing you always do, that doesn't get your muscles any stronger. That kind of just, you kind of just nudge along at the same level. But if you can push your body a little bit where you're maybe you're a little bit sore later that day or the next day, you're not trying to injure yourself or do anything crazy, but get a little bit of extra push in those muscles that can go a long way towards strengthening them and keeping everything really you know, in place. Um, so if you can find a, you know, little dumbbells, like we said, resistance bands, or even just body weight, body weight stuff like squatting or sit-ups or push-ups or um, any kind of thing that can really, that feels a little stressful or strain on you is gonna be a good thing to do. Um, and if you can do, you know, want to keep it within your comfort zone so it shouldn't be something you can only do once and then you have to just collapse down into a chair or something it should be something that you're pretty comfortable doing about 10 times and then you can then take a few minutes off and then go back and do it again and that's going to be a sweet spot there where you're creating enough strain on the muscles that they get stronger without doing so much that you're going to create any kind of injury or problem in the muscles and so this is a bigger list of some basic kind of aerobic as well as muscle strengthening activities that you can do. Uh, and so you can see on the left here, just walking, dancing, swimming, you know, jogging, yoga, water aerobics, um, going out and doing some yard work, like, like raking, um, playing things like pickleball or basketball. Um, any of that can be enough to get your heart rate up and get you, you know, staying healthy. Um, and then on the muscle strength side, Yoga again, Tai Chi, these are more postural things. These can really strengthen your core muscles. Um, and then additional kinds of gardening, yard work, things where you're kind of working in your shoulders and your legs more. And then like we said, strengthening things like resistance bands and push-ups, pull-ups, squats, lunges, planks, all of that. Anything where your body's not quite happy with you but uh, is able to do it is usually a good thing for you to try. And then there's things like balance training exercises. So some of that comes along with strength. Some of that comes along with the aerobic and then balance um, is a nice way to sort of, I think, combine those things because we really want to avoid falls, particularly as we get older. Falls can be really dangerous where you can you know, hit your hip, hit your back, hit your head. Um, and any of those things could be really a devastating injury that needs surgery or you know, decreases our mobility <clears throat> for the rest of our lives. Um, so if we can avoid any fall, that's always, 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 always going to be a goal of ours. Um, so simple things like this, you know, they list a few different things, practicing walking heel to toe, where you're taking these short little steps and working on your balance and keeping your core all together. Um, going from standing to sitting and sitting to standing. So sitting up repeatedly, A, that acts like a little squat exercise and, <clears throat> um, B, you know, it gives you that practice that you need. Uh, maybe later in life to, to get up out of the chair or off the couch um, successfully without any kind of concern for tipping over or tripping or anything like that. And then like we mentioned, core exercises in general are going to be what's so important to keeping the middle of you that everything attaches to all in one place and all together and all over your feet and, and keep it from falling over. 
And along with that flexibility is really important too, because I think our muscles get tighter as we get older, our joints get a little creakier, our joints get tighter. We don't want to move as much. And so flexibility can really go down. And all of a sudden, something that would have been an easy way, you know, easily for you to catch yourself if you're stumbling all of a sudden becomes a fall um, because you didn't, you couldn't quite move your leg in the way that you wanted to, or you used to be able to, and you weren't ready for that difference in your flexibility. Um, so this is just, you know, basic stretching can be really helpful and help with the posture. So, you know, we all sit with our backs like this now hunched forward and it can help prevent things like that. Um, it can help reduce the pain from your lower back and arthritis pain. Um, and like you said, it can, it can reduce your risk of falls as well. So can I jump and in with a question here? Absolutely, quickly? please, yeah. So talking about, uh, you know, aerobic activities, muscle building, yeah those for balance and flexibility. Do you find it's good for someone to kind of, and actually this might get to, to, to your next slide here. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna say sort of like, Monday is gonna be my aerobic day, Tuesday muscle building, Wednesday balance and flexibility, or is it really best to sort of get a little bit of each of those during a given a given workout? Or is that really- It's a great fit? question. Uh, you know, I, I think as with most things like act, physical activity related, the best answer is going to be what works best for the individual. Um, I don't think that there is a clear health benefit if we're talking strictly about medical things. You know, is it better to have all of your aerobic at once or have sort of, you know, appropriate days kind of partitioned out for yourself? I think if you are the kind of person who really just likes to go for a walk and you want to walk for 60 minutes, that's great. If you want to do a couple of 10 minute walks here or there, you know, a couple of times a day and then fit your strength training in in between or go for a walk and bring your weights with you and stuff like that, whatever kind of fits into your day best and fits into, you know, a routine that you can find enjoyment in and that you can then return to is going to be what's most important. It's the same kind of way that I think about things like diet, um, where, you know, when people ask what's the best diet and you say, well, the best diet is the one that you can maintain that you can stick with. Um, so, you know, sometimes people are very restrictive with their food um, and they lose a ton of weight. And then if a couple months go by and they hate their diet and they hate their life and they go, go and eat the same things they used to and they go right back to where they started from. And I think of this a lot in the same ways when we're trying to change a, a way that we're addressing it, sort of a, a habit in our lives is that you want to do what's sustainable for yourself. And the best thing for you is going to be what you can do every day. Um, so if you like to, you know, really partition things out and just walk one day and just do weights the next, that is great. If you like to do a little bit of everything all at once, just as great, whatever works best for you. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, as you can see here, uh, doing it a couple days a week, getting it in, you know, three days a week, if you can, is probably a good, good goal to have. And I, I don't think most people are going for a two and a half hour you know, jog or something, and then never working out again the rest of the week. So like we said, if you can break things up, so every other day you're doing something, that's an easy way to get started. And you don't need to rush into it and do all two and a half hours, day one or week one. This is something where we're trying to build healthy habits as time goes on. And so you want to start, start low and, and go slow, as it says, to um, slowly ramp up your activity with what you're comfortable with. I think you see there's a hand raised. Is that right? Um, there is a hand. Uh, Bill, I can unmute you if you want to ask your question. Um, uh, if you want to ask your question by by voice. So if you do want to ask your question, you should be able to unmute yourself now and and ask. Sorry about that. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is the right time to in, to ask the question, but. Um, and if it's too specific, um, but um, I've been having, um, I've been struggling with trying to um, go from my physical therapy program uh, into the gym. Uh, it seems mm -hmm. like it's been, you know, uh, trying to experiment with things. And uh, um, I know, you know, going slow and um, um, gradual is, is important, but um, anyway, um, is this a good time to ask that question or, or, or yeah sure there's no bad time happy to happy okay. to talk whenever yeah so that's main pretty much the question is um how do i you know uh, you know physical th therapy stops at some point and then there's you know you're kind of left hanging in a way i mean i did try to ask questions about the gym but 
it yeah. just feels like it's sort of you know you're on your own <laughs> yeah and, you know my goal always when people come back from physical therapy or see us in the office is that they get a transition plan to go home to their own gym or you know to their own workout routine um so they're not left hanging like this so if you know for one thing, I think your physical therapist certainly may have some a packet of exercises or something that they could pass along to you uh, to address you know, some of the focus, you know, focus on the things that you've been working on with them. Um, yeah, because they, their they, goal also, yeah. Yeah, they've done Start that, yeah. Uh, and I've done okay. that with the home program, but it's term, yeah. in terms of, um, you know, the equipment at the gym and that kind of thing. And that, yeah. And, and my doctor, I've never, I didn't know which doctor to ask, you know, you know, you're talking about, um, you as a physician, mm -hmm. um, who do I go to, to 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 ask for that kind of plan? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I, like I said, the physical therapist is always a good person, a good resource in those situations, as well as you know your primary care doctor um, probably has a packet or you know something that they could pass along to you. Um, depending on what you're working on, you know that would give you a list of exercises with pictures and kind of descriptions of them and a routine that you can go into um, kind of to focus on what you've been working on. Um, and even, you know, if, if, if you're struggling with the transition from the physical therapy office or the physical therapy gym to the home gym, you know, the, the, the gym that is a different setup, it's different equipment, it's kind of hard to adapt to that. I think that um, even just talking to staff at the, at the, you know, at the gym, like at Planet Fitness or wherever you're going and asking them to, if they can show you how to use some of the, the machines or how to adapt some of the things that you're trying to do to their equipment, is going to be a totally appropriate question that they will be able to answer really well for you. A trainer there would be able to do that? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. If you have, you know, if you've got some things that you've been working on and you wanted some advice about how to adapt that to their setup, they would okay. certainly be able to help you with that. Yeah. Okay. That's a reasonable way to go about that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Without trying to pay for a, a, a trainer. Yeah. I don't No, I don't think you need to pay a personal trainer or anything. I think the gym staff is, is perfectly capable of kind of adapting you and your workout to their equipment and showing okay. you how to go about doing stuff like that. That would be well within their expertise. Yeah. Okay. Cause I'm, I've been going to the gym for a num number of years. Uh, um, it's just, um, because um, I've had back fusion and a, a, and a hip replacement and surgery within several months of each other. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, that's what I'm dealing with. So I, I'll do what you're, you're telling me. So yeah. Yeah. And so those are, yeah, those are significant surgeries that um, need some workarounds that maybe your old routine doesn't quite fit into anymore. Right. Um, but I think if you're, you know, if you what the staff know what you're trying to work on or what your deficiencies are, where, you know, you don't feel comfortable doing something, they could certainly adapt to you and, and give you some advice for machines that would work the same kind of muscle groups without putting your, you know, your hip or your back in jeopardy. Okay, I need to communicate more. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I think Thank we all do. We all, we all do. Yes, absolutely. Um, Thanks for the okay. question, though. Um, as far as, you know, how do we go about going into this? Like, this is a, you know, briefly just saying that warming up and cooling down is usually a good idea. Um, of course, a five to 10 minute warm up, if you're only doing 10 minutes of activity at a time, maybe that is your activity. But again, it's something just to get your blood flowing a little bit, your heart rate up a bit, your muscles moving and, and, and lengthening a little bit so that you're not going to pull anything, uh, you're not going to pull your hamstring or something. And then the same kind of thing when you're cooling down, giving yourself a little bit of stretching, a little uh, a little time to let those muscles relax back out. Um, that will go a long way towards reducing soreness and allowing for healing for any uh, small little uh, strains that you put on your muscle, which are a good thing, right? That's gonna be how you build your strength. I think these are one of the, some of the main questions and concerns people have as they get older about exercise. So, you know, for example, am I gonna make my arthritis worse? The doctor told me that, um, I have knee arthritis because I ran when I was younger, or my knee arthritis is getting worse because I'm, I've been trying to walk more. And I cannot tell you uh, enough that walking is a good thing. Exercise is a good thing. You are not making your arthritis worse by exercising. That's one point I definitely want to drill home for anyone who might be having that question or concern, is that keeping your body moving, keeping your joints moving 
tells your joints to keep making good joint food and tells your joints to keep working the way that they're supposed to. And it does not make your arthritis worse. It can, you know, your arthritis may, some for some people who have arthritis, working, you know, walking more can cause more pain. And that's something that we can certainly acknowledge and agree on, but it does not make the arthritis get worse. It does not make, you know, your cartilage wear down or your bones worse. It can make your discomfort worse in the moment, but it does not make your chronic condition worse. And you can actually prevent arthritis by continuing to move and walk and 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 do things like that. So they've even done studies that showed um, people who swim every day or people who walk every day, you know, who had more knee arthritis when they looked years and years later. Um, and everyone assumed that it was going to be the people who walked instead of swimming. Um, and actually, the swimmers had more arthritis. Um, so it kind of shows that these kind of weight, you know, bearing weight and moving around and using your joints and your muscles is actually protective of your joints. It's not bad for them. Um, you know, that being said, if, if, as we said, if you have bad arthritis that hurts when you walk, there are ways to adapt to that. So things like exercising in the water or, you know, using reduced, you know, sort of reduced weight bearing things like on a bicycle or a recumbent bicycle, um, or you know, physical therapy and weightlifting exercises that you can do sitting down or lying down. You know, there are so many different ways that you can work around a creaky joint here or there that can still involve the muscles that are close by and far away and keep them strong. And same kind of thing with diabetes. You know, I think people worry too that oh, my blood sugar is going to be off. Is it okay if I get my heart rate up? But what will happen to my blood sugar? Um, and in general, exercise is really good for people with diabetes. Um, we want to make sure that you have good footwear and that we're keeping track of your blood sugar, particularly if you're on something like insulin where it can affect your blood sugar to bring it too low. Um, but generally speaking, moving around and exercising with diabetes is great. As it says there, it reduces your risk for heart disease. It can lower your body weight. It can lower your blood sugar and your need for medications. Um, these are all really good things that you can benefit from when you have chronic conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, anything like that. We want to set, address also that, you know, as we said, people have physical limitations, whether it's, you know, a knee replacement, a hip replacement, a knee arthritis, it's, you know, you've got paralysis in one leg, you've got low back pain that prevents you from standing up well, um, you have foot problems, you have back problems, you have anything, Parkinson's, you've had a stroke and one side of your body isn't as strong as the other. Um, all of these things can be adapted around and really like a good course of physical therapy, like we talked about. Um, can set you on the right track to learn some exercises that can adapt for the long run where, you know, if you're not, if you go to the gym and see a bunch of 25 year olds that are throwing big weights around and things like that, it can be really intimidating and you say, I can never do that. But there are ways for you to work those same exact muscles and, and you know, obtain all the same benefits that we want you to have um, without, you know, oh, pushing yourself or, or trying to, to compete in a, a strongman competition or anything. There are certain benefits that we can really get with even small adjustments as you can see with like a small small weights in a seated position that's plenty to, to really do something good for you um <clears throat> and so you know if you're if you have questions or you're you're not sure if you should start an exercise activity um it's certainly a good time to talk to your doctor you can certainly ask hey is it okay if i do this i have this condition um is it okay if i do this kind of physical activity would that be safe for me um, and there are, you know, certain rare instances where we'll say, maybe not, that's not, maybe that's not a good idea for you. Maybe there's something different that we can recommend, but there's always going to be something that we can recommend. Um, if you've had a recent injury or illness, that's a good time to talk to them as well to say, Hey, is it good for me to get back into this? How should I approach this gradual reintroduction? Um, and then of course, if you're having chest pain, particularly, you know, trouble breathing or trouble breathing, particularly when you're doing an activity or exercise, we want to know about that right away because that could certainly be a sign that your heart needs a little bit of help from us. Um, and before we push it even further down that path of physical activity, we want to get a couple things looked at. But that's just a you know a good way to push yourself and find out if your body's doing okay. It's kind of a good check-in with yourself. So if you do have that kind of symptom, stop, let us know, and then you know we'll take a good look at you. And so last thing I want to talk about is just how to get started with things like this. Um, there are lots of different ways. Um, to get moving and to sort of either find the motivation or activities or uh, you know, find programs around you that can be adapted to your needs that, you know, maybe have the less, less intimidating than, like we said, walking into a gym with a bunch of strangers and uh, figuring out how to do things on the fly. 
Um, so there's the Silver Sneakers program, um, which works with Medicare. Uh, it's, it's free for adults over the age of 65 and has lots of different good uh, activities there. There are lots of different free exercises on apps and websites. So there's things like the My Fitness app. Um, there's the Silver Sneakers website as well. Like we said, um, there's lots of different uh, free activity, just you know, things where if you want to just pull up your phone or pull up your computer, you can find things to do. Um, as we said, gym memberships can be very good as well. And then even things just like around the neighborhood or around the house, whether that's doing yard work, doing gardening, um, uh, doing housework, just walking around the block, kind of just you know, seeing what's around you, uh, checking out your surroundings. All of that is a, is a perfectly viable way to get an activity um, without you know, breaking the bank or getting too far from home. So as you can see in Center City, Philadelphia, there's lots of different uh, locations with, close by where people can get involved. The South Philadelphia Older Adult Center on Pashyunk uh, is certainly a great resource and they have uh, activities and information and, and programs there that can be really helpful. Um, and there are other places that you can look up as well. So for example, even like the Christian Street YMCA membership is, is I think pretty affordable for people over the age of 65. Uh, and they've got some good activities and classes there as well that can really plug you into an exercise plan and introduce you to something that can you can build on as time goes on. Uh, and many insurance plans actually have benefits as well that will either subsidize or, or pay for completely gym memberships that are worth looking into and contacting your insurance plan about as well. Can I throw in a couple you, more, Mike? Yeah, sure. Um, so I just also want to say, and the, the, the South Philadelphia Older Adult Center is a great one, um, but there are senior centers all over Philly. So if, yeah. especially for folks who aren't local to, uh, to Center City, um, find, finding your local senior center, um, Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, PCA, um, can, can connect you to your local facility. Not all of them have gym facilities, but a lot of them do have uh, low cost exercise uh, classes. A lot of them are part of the Silver Sneakers program. Um, or just have workout equipment that you can use there. Um, and then also just want to elaborate on your your point, Mike, about the the free websites. One of the, I think that we, we've actually, we've done an exercise doctors in before, and I think it was a couple of years ago in the kind of the early yeah. days. Of COVID. Um, and one of the nice things, you know, to, to, if we can find silver linings of the pandemic with, with so much more going virtual, um, yeah. so like AARP, if you're an AARP member, they have a great virtual hub of, uh, of guided exercise classes live on demand. Um, so you, even just finding some good YouTube channels. Um, again, as you were saying, that that can get around some of the the trepidation of, oh, I'm going to go to a gym and, and, you know, might feel insecure about, you know, being able to do all the exercises as well as others. Um, so that's also something for people to consider. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's pretty there's a resource for everyone at any level that you can feel comfortable with. Absolutely. And um, these fitness trackers are another thing that can kind of just keep track of things for you. And these are nice because they can sort of exist in the background um, where you don't even realize you did, you know, 3000 steps just because you went to the kitchen and you went down the block to the store and you, you know, all of a sudden over the course of the day, you realize you did actually a good amount of physical activity. And that can reassure you that, you know, you're living a life that keeps you active. And they can also remind you, hey, you need to walk a little bit more. Hey, you need to get up and stand up and move around some. You've been sitting down for too long. And so they're keeping track of some of those negative things that, you know, and encouraging you to have more positive uh, changes in your life. Um, a lot of these are also have things like EKG monitoring. They can monitor your heart rate and your heart rhythm. Um, they have fall detection systems. There's a lot of really interesting technology out there um, that can be really helpful, particularly for older adults. Um, that can keep track of a lot of small little health things as well as big things um, and keep you motivated and healthy. Um, another <clears throat> uh, program is the Walk with Ease program. Uh, this is with uh, the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance. Um, and these are like self, again, self-directed walking programs where if you feel comfortable going out and going for a walk, either with yourself or, you know, I'd certainly would recommend with a neighbor or a friend or a partner or a relative, um, you know, or you get a couple of you together and you try to get your activity uh, in together. Like we said, you can still talk as long as, you, as you're talking, that's fine. You're still going fast enough to get your heart rate up. Um, all of these are really valid and, and valuable ways to get exercise. Uh, and uh, I think like a six week program introduces you to something gradually and then establishes maybe a new routine in your life where 
you know that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, you're going to go for a walk for 30 minutes. And that's going to be kind of how you do your exercise. Those are really good ways for us to do that. I have another question, Bill, I'm going to mm -hmm. give you, take you off mute so you can ask your question again. Hi, yeah, I don't, I don't know if this is appropriate, but um, I just wanted to, I'm a little overwhelmed with all the fitness trackers and I was wondering sure. if there's one that is um, not high cost, but is effective that you recommend. Um, yeah, you know, I don't I don't have a particular endorsement to give you or anything. I, I certainly okay. have no, uh, all right. I have no endorsement. I, I have no, you know, monetary stake in any of these things or anything like that. Right. There right. are, you know, there are like Fitbit devices and things like that, that are, you can, you know, I don't think you need anything super technological will be okay. my main point. Um, the main goal for them should be to nudge you to move around sometimes to keep track of your steps and see if you're, you know, not quite getting as far or as long as you want to be doing. Um, but all of the bells and whistles that go on, some of them that cost $500 and all that, I don't think you need that. Um, there are Fitbits that are well under $100 that I have seen or Fitbit knockoffs that are well under $100. And those I think are just fine and do the job that we need them to do. Um, so I don't think you should be breaking the bank for anything like that. Um, just, you know, it's obviously it depends on how you want to use it. But like I said, I think the best use of them is just as a reminder and sort of to keep track of what you're doing. Uh, and all of these are, are perfectly capable of that. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so these are, again, a few more, you know, ideas of things that we can do. YouTube is a great resource, particularly as, as David said, that like since the pandemic, YouTube has become such a great place for us to find little exercise videos and introductions and ways that we can do yoga at home or do little workouts and things like that. Um, it's just, there's so many different little things that we can be doing just around the house. And you can see these are people filming in their living rooms, on their rugs, in their basements, in their front yards. Like this is not something where you have to go out and do something or spend money. It's a free website and it's doing it at your own house. Um, it's is really, really adaptable and doable for anyone. Um, so I think this has been a great thing that like Philly Parks and Recreation has put together their own channel where they're doing a lot of these things. And I think that um, they're in tune, you know, attuned to the needs of our, our, our older citizens, as well as, you know, what resources we might have or not have. And you don't have a, if you don't have a 5,000 square foot house with your own private basketball court, that's okay. We'll make it work with whatever you do have in your row home. Um, so there's lots of options there for you. And then this is the Silver Sneakers website that we had talked about earlier as well. Um, and then they have the AARP website that David also mentioned. So yeah, as we said, there's tons of things that have come up since COVID that have really uh, made life very easy for us. And there's certainly uh, a quick Google search will find you lots of different opportunities and, and things to do. Um, but so basically just to summarize, as far as what we talked about, um, sitting less, moving more is gonna be the best thing we can do for you. 150 minutes of moderate intensity. So that like walking speed kind of activity per week is enough to really, to decrease your risk of death by up to 30, 35%. Um, muscle strengthening exercise can be very helpful as well to prevent falls and other uh, injuries. Balance training as well is really good to prevent falls, same kind of idea. Uh, and if you have any questions or concerns, uh, we as healthcare providers are always happy to talk about those things. If you aren't sure about your particular chronic condition, your medical history, your prior injuries, or what to, kind of how to start these things, talk to your doctor about it. We're always happy to have those conversations. And honestly, when someone comes into my office and says, I want to start moving more, that's like highlight of my day, because that's a great thing. That's what we always want to hear, right? I don't want to hear, give me a pill that fixes me. I want to hear that you are, you're ready to do things and we all want to do, you know, we want to work with you together on stuff like that. Um, that's all that I have. Does anyone have any other questions about, you know, getting moving? So all uh, encouraging folks to, to get their questions in. Um, but one that I had kind of going along with that, that last slide about when to see your doctor, how to talk to your doctor. Yeah. yeah. So you are a sports medicine specialist, fe uh, a fellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm thrilled to have, have sports med fellows be part of Doctor Is In, which is new for us this year. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about when someone, particularly an older adult, would 
be referred to to you um, or when someone would be best suited to make an appointment with a sports medicine specialist mm -hmm. as opposed to a geriatrician or a physical therapist as we talked about a little bit before yeah absolutely yeah and i think i think if you you know are looking to just kind of get moving again get yourself back into physical activity talking to your primary doctor someone who you have a relationship with and kind of knows your medical history totally reasonable they're going to be able to answer your questions and provide a good plan for you i think us sports medicine doctors um we are we are certainly happy to certainly able to answer those questions as well um but we won't know you as well if we haven't met you before and that can be hard sometimes to go through your whole new medical history with someone new um but sports medicine doctors are great. I think as you're going along that journey, if you have any aches or pains, you suffer, you have any kind of injury history and you're not sure if that injury in particular is gonna be compatible with a particular activity, um, or if you're trying to come up with you know new strategies or, or, or you, know, you do think you need some kind of treatment for something where you get yourself moving again and now your hip is hurting or your knee is hurting or you know, your Achilles tendon, your shoulder, those are things where we can get x-rays, we can do ultrasounds, we can do injections or procedures that might help but if uh, if that's what's holding you back from doing something or if it flares up when you start doing something again. So um, there's ways that we can really address pain and functionality in our office, I think, um, that can be very beneficial for people who are trying to move. And there were two things I was supposed to to plug earlier when I was mentioning some <laughs> of the resources. Um, one, we do have at William Way uh, a yoga class for older adults on Thursday mornings. Uh, so anyone interested, I can get you more info on that. Um, and we also have some uh, some tablets. Uh, so if folks are need to ever borrow a tablet to do some of these virtual um, at home fitness classes, that is also something that we can help uh, help individuals with. Uh, and so just let me know if you have more uh, any questions about that for folks who are watching um there's a little lag on on facebook so i want to make sure we have gotten any uh questions that came in there sure um one other one that that i'll i'll pose for you uh mike is talk a little bit about some of the the practical ways to get started but any tips for for folks who just have that sort of the emotional uh challenge with sort of getting getting started with with taking the initiative to start something new um and whether that is because of of concerns of aggravating an injury yeah a health condition or even aside from that just sort of the hey this doesn't sound fun to go with <coughs> you know, muscle building exercise like how to really motivate yeah getting. yeah um yeah i know I, my dad always said to me since i was a little kid that the hardest you know the hardest workout is the first one uh yeah. like the hardest day to get up and go for a run is the first time until it's the second day and you're sore from the first one, then the hardest is the second one, but it gets easier every day after that. Um, so knowing that as you get more comfortable and confident in these things, it will get better. Um, but that doesn't get you over the hump initially. You know, I think the motivation and um, like stewardship that can go along with that, one of those things really is just involving people around you. Um, so if you can work with, like I said, you know, a relative, your partner, your spouse, your grandchild, your child, your nephew, you know, if there's someone there who can work with you, your neighbor, your friend, anyone, um, where you guys can kind of hold each other accountable, and also provide some of that external motivation that might help, you know, the internal motivation break that cycle of not moving, um, where it can be really hard if you've been if you haven't been doing something for years to all of a sudden, turn around and do it. Um, and so sometimes if you enlist the help of someone near you or close to you, who you know, you'll listen to and you and, you know, can appreciate their advice, they'll be able to nudge you in the right direction and, and get you uh, over that last little little obstacle where uh, you might otherwise say, eh, you know, maybe tomorrow. If someone else is counting on you, maybe it's not as easy to say no that day. It's a great point. And also a great opportunity for, for socialization as a, a reason to- Yeah, exactly, exactly. In your neighborhood or uh, in your housing complex. I don't see any other questions coming in, so I think we can wrap it up there, but want to give a big thanks to you, Mike, for okay. being part of Doctors In, for spending the past hour with us um, and sharing all this great information and resources. Uh, I think it's a lot of really valuable um, information. So thank you for that. Um, and thanks again to folks who join us here on Zoom or watch us on Facebook or are seeing this recording later. Uh, thank you for being part of the Doctor Is In programming. 
Hope everyone has a great rest of the day, rest of the month, and we'll see you in June for our next Doctors In program.